to you, conversationalists all across the fruited plain. You can breathe that huge sigh of relief. Yes, my friends, that day has come when I have returned. I am here, ready to serve humanity and once again be with you. Happy to be with you. Happy you have joined us. The telephone number, if you want to be on the program, is 800-282-2882. Rush Limbaugh, back in the saddle. This is a special edition of the Rush Limbaugh program. America, the way it ought to be. And now, returning from vacation, here is the winner of the National Association of Broadcasting's top syndicated radio oh. personality of the year, Marconi Award, oh. again. Rush Limbaugh. Thank you. I wasn't even going to mention it. I was... You people know I am not a braggadocious sort. I was not going to mention that I had won that award. Besides, did you see who all was nominated? I didn't recognize any of the others. Why is that? That's because there aren't any others. Now, I'm, I'm uh, in all candor, <clears throat> I am... Uh, I was honored. I got a phone call... Uh, Gee, must have been 1 o'clock uh, Sunday morning, Saturday night, which uh, from someone who was in attendance at the National Association of Broadcasters uh, big radio awards gala in New Orleans on Saturday night. And uh, I have won the Marconi Award for the second time. And I'm deeply honored because I'll tell you what, the, the people who vote on this are people in the industry. Uh, general managers and, and uh, program directors from across the fruited plain. And there are people, I think, uh, because some of the people in my category are DJs with some of these, you know, top 40 of the week shows, which means they're on 2,000 stations or 1,500 stations once a week on a Sunday. You figure that um, they have more of those, the more stations you're on, the greater chance you have at winning. But it didn't turn out that way. Um, we're on 660 stations, and I don't think that pirate station down in Trinidad, Tobago, if it's still on the air after the hurricane, uh, was, <laughs> was allowed to vote. I want to uh, I want to thank all three of our guest hosts, uh, Tony Snow, Michael Medved, and Walter Williams, for uh, doing a tremendous job. Uh, I was uh, reading some of the mail from CompuServe. Every one of those guys was loved and, and appreciated. A couple of them got some, you know, wise remarks. I'm not going to tell you which ones. There's no different than the kind of stuff I get, you know. So <laughs> if I figure welcome them. Well, it's a good sign. Welcome them to the club. Uh, and some of you are concerned about uh, Tony Snow's wife. Everything's fine. I think he had an emergency, or she did, at the hospital on Friday, and he had to leave right before the program Friday. And uh, we we found, uh, which is not hard to do, a best of rush show. Found it real quick. Mr. Snurdly put it together, El Quico, and uh, got it up and running. And and Tony had to wing his way back down to D.C. Everything's fine uh, with Tony and his wife. It was a medical emergency, but it has. It's worked out just fine. Uh, here again is the telephone number, folks, 800-282-2882. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff that went on, and I, I, I don't even know if I could, if I started with a list, if I could hit everything that happened. I'm going to do some, but I'm, the, the, I, I don't, because here's my problem. You know what I promised? I promised you, I promised myself these two weeks I wasn't going to watch anything. I wasn't going to read anything. I wasn't going to do it. And I just couldn't do it. So profound is my devotion to you. So profound is my sense of duty to this program and to this country that I just, you know, it, the, I could not go through a day uninformed. I, it's, it, 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 I just couldn't do it. I, I, uh, I, I, try, I tried one day. I got till 11 o'clock one night and I, I succumbed to the temptation to um, hit a news channel on a television, and I, I, got, I got roped in. And I must confess, I watched some of the OJ trial while I was gone, some of those things that happened. So I have a list of things that I'm going to have brief comments on, but if I don't touch on your subject, or if, if whatever it is, if you have anything you would like to discuss with me that touches on matters that occurred in the past two weeks, then uh, feel free 
to do so at 800-282-2882. I'm not going to pick anything up in any particular order here, but I, I, I do have um, a couple of things here that, that, that we, ought to, we ought to start with. First off, the, uh, the resignation of Bob Packwood. Uh, or Bob Packwoody, uh, as uh, it is <laughs> some, some places uh, privately known. <laughs> Bob Packwoody. Um, of all the things that I noticed, I think Senator Packwood deserves some plaudits. I think he deserves some credit, and I think he deserves uh, a, 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 at least a measure of respect. I think Senator Packwood showed great courage. I think Senator Packwood showed it as nerdly as about to have the proverbial cow. I think Senator Packwood uh, <clears throat> showed bravery when he strode to the floor of the Senate to resign and did not wear a neck brace. Senator Packwood showed up normal. He did not show up with a crooked finger from having doctored the diaries. He did not show up with a bandage on the head. He did not show up with a neck brace that you might wear if you'd driven your car off a bridge and claimed to be wounded for months and months and months. No, Senator Packwood showed up all natural. And I have, I, I have to tell you, <laughs> I almost called in. Remember the vacation pledge? Got you, didn't I? Snurdly's in there. He doesn't like Packwood at all. And he thought, my gosh, what's Rush doing these two weeks? Something's happened to the little gray cells. The vacation pledge, I told you people that if the president resigned, I would call in. That if O.J. confessed, I would call in. That if something momentous happened, I would call in. Well, I want to tell you people something. I came this close to calling in. I mean, I've got my fingers here about an eighth of an inch apart. I came about that close. I mean, I was far away from the command center here at EIB. I was far away from SATCOM 5C with our CDET digital analog decoder. I was as far away from here as one can possibly get. And so instead of getting the news before anybody, I was getting the news in bits and pieces, just like you usually do. You know, when, when, see, when I can't do the show and when you can't hear me do the show, then we're all in the same boat. We're all getting our news from the other guys, the mainstream media. And so I was just like you are on a daily basis without me. I was catching matters of fact after the fact. I was catching bits of news after the fact. And I had an incomplete picture. I said, my gosh, what's going on? Some of this stuff didn't sound right. First, I heard a politician had resigned. Wow. And then I'd heard it was because of sexual improprieties. And I thought, my gosh, has Paula Jones prevailed? I said, could this be it? The politicians resigned because of sexual improprieties. I remember I pledged to call in, so I, I, I made a point to tune in even closer to the news. Then I heard that this politician had been pressuring people all along to give his wife a job. And I thought, hmm, who could that be? Could it be Hillary Clinton? No, but it, you can see how my line of thought went this way. And then the third charge against this particular politician, he withheld records from Congress. And he lied to his diary. He doctored his diary. He said, well, this could be Travelgate. This could be Whitewater. This could be it. This could be the resignation we've all thought was going to come. I could have made a mad dash to the phone. And then, then I found out that it wasn't Bill Clinton. It was Bob Packwoody. So I did. I put... I put the I put the <laughs> I put the phone back. It was depressing. I wanted to call in. I wanted to be with you people. I wanted to talk to you. Uh, the um, Packwood resignation story is now what four days old. Is that right? Four or five days old. What's what's left to say now? What can I add to the Bob Packwood story that's not been said by anybody else? What? 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 <clears throat> well, I'll tell you what. Here's the way I look at it. And I'm making no excuses for Packwood. I mean, look, don't misunderstand any of this. I'm, I, I think that what you basically have here is, is uh, exactly what's wrong with the Senate. And I think this is a good case for term limits, actually. I think what you have here, this guy's been in Congress 30 years. 
27 years? I'm, I, folks, don't care who you are, you, you're there that long, and the arrogance of power is something that's got to just take you over. Um, but we've, we've now gone from Ted Kennedy to Christopher Dodd to Jerry Studs to Barney Frank, uh, even Daniel in no way, the senator from Hawaii, and, of course, all those people are still there and still triumphant and still powerful and with no one challenging them. But Packwood, of course, is gone. So this stuff really is for Republicans only. In fact, there wasn't, any, there wasn't much of an outcry over Mel Reynolds uh, as much as there was uh, over Packwood. Uh, now, the, the feminists here in this situation are amazing to me too because you know Packwood did more for feminist causes than Hillary Clinton and Pat Schroeder and Barbara Boxer combined. Bob Packwood has been their single greatest staunchest ally in the Republican Party. Uh, he'll, in fact, Packwood did more for women's causes as they are defined under the umbrella of, uh, of uh, feminism uh, than Barbara Boxer will do in her lifetime. And of course it doesn't count for much. Um, and I'm, I, I, you know, maybe you won't like this comparison, but what, what do we have here? We have, we have Bob Peckwood and uninvited kisses, and we have <clears throat> O.J. Simpson and a potential conviction on double murder, and where's the outrage? Is it Bob Peckwood for uninvited kisses? So, anyway, I, I, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing. And I, from a political standpoint, I'm not, I'm not so disappointed. And it was, it was only a matter of time for this to happen. Some of the other things that we'll address as the program unfolds, no doubt in, uh, in conjunction with your phone calls, and that would be Cal Ripken, uh, George Stephanopoulos and his expired license and expired registration. Um, John F. Kennedy Jr., John John's New Magazine, George. Um, Rock and Roll Museum opened, Ruby Ridge and Randy Weaver. And, you know, my friends, we don't normally talk about these kinds of tabloid subjects, but can we let this program go by without mentioning in sadness the passing of yet another Elizabeth Taylor marriage? How, which one was this? Seven, eight, what does it matter? I have a solution to this. Everybody's wondering who next. Liz cannot be alone. La Liz must be married. Who will it be? Who's got the experience necessary to marry Liz Taylor? And there's only one guy, Larry King. He's got as much experience being married as Elizabeth Taylor does. This is a match made in heaven. So somebody, play Cupid out there. Get them together. King's going to be out in Hollywood doing the O.J. Suck a trial. Uh, get them together. I mean, you, combine marriages in this crew. <laughs> this is the only way to go. It's the only way. Mary King and Liz Taylor. He maybe have more experience than she does, which is what she needs. A man who knows more than she does about things. That's why Fortensky never had a prayer. We'll take a break. Again, the phone number is 800-282-2882. Don't go away. We'll be right back. You're listening to the EIB Network on 77 WABC. Marconi Award-winning Rush Limbaugh, the excellence in broadcasting network at the Limbaugh Institute for Advanced Conservative Studies. And again, the telephone number 800-282-2882. How about the uh, fling in Beijing? All of these NAG members over in China. This, this thing has been a joke from, this, from the rain to the fact that Chinese wouldn't let them in to the fact that they uh, uh, were over there. Actually, two different things have been going on at this conference. And I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it because it's, it's, a, uh, it, it's, it's a fait accompli now. But there's a, there's a story in the front page of the New York Times that's just... You know how I've been saying, when it comes to liberals... You gotta watch out because you start cracking jokes about them and eventually the jokes come true. And while I was on vacation, while I was out, I had Martin and I watching some videotape of this conference, uh, UN conference on women over in, in Beijing. And, and I said to her, I said, Marta, you mark my words, these women are so serious about things that um, they are going 
to uh, come out uh, with a resolution that, that claims uh, that any woman anywhere in the world can say, by, by virtue of this conference, not tonight, honey, I have a headache. They're, gonna, they're actually going to formalize this uh, in, in this UN conference on women. I was making a joke, and of course she's... <laughs> well, my friends, I laughed at my joke. And here it is a week later, and here's the front page headline of today's New York Times. Women's meeting agrees on right to say no to sex. A spouse's prerogative. <laughs> Draft wording asserts right to make sexual decisions free from coercion. Now, what's the implication of this? The implication is that only, only under coercion does sex with spouses take place. And that without this resolution, which confirms a woman's right to say no to sex, can this horrible problem be stopped? In Connecticut, a, uh, in Hartford, they were going to have a huge, this is over the weekend, a huge anti, or actually pro-affirmative action rally at the capital of Connecticut. NAC, NAACP officials hoped that thousands would show up. Fewer than 100 did. Fewer than 100, yet there were hopes for thousands. Uh, Colin Powell, uh, his memoirs are now being excerpted in various publications, Time Magazine. He's granted interviews uh, sparsely here and there. And it's generating a lot of talk. It's generating a lot of uh, punditry. There's, there's um, one little brief uh, uh, excerpt that's published in a New York paper today in which uh, Colin Powell says that society has lost its sense of shame and he blames it on tell-all television talk shows. In his soon-to-be-released memoirs, the retired general saves some of his harshest criticism for pop culture, particularly daytime trash TV. He writes, We seem to have lost our sense of shame as a society. Nothing seems to embarrass us. Nothing shocks us anymore. He says that tabloid talk, tabloid talk shows litter daytime television and offer a parade of dysfunctional people whose morally vacant behavior offers the worst possible model for others. What can be done? A sense of shame is not a bad moral compass, Powell wrote. I remember how easy it was for my mother to snap me back into line with a simple rebuke. I am ashamed of you. You embarrass the family. I would have preferred a beating to those words. So, here it is. Colin Powell, I guess, makes it official. Daytime television talk shows are harmful to America. I've only been saying this for how many years? I guess I should run for president now. I guess I'm qualified to run for president. I wonder how much else is in this book that a number of other people have already been saying all these years. It's going to be interesting to see, folks. And I, this is not a put down of Colin Powell. This is more an assessment of how we view people and how we determine who's credible and who isn't. Because you could take... What if, for example... Who is the most despised figure in America today? Throw the name out of me. Who's the worst? Who, who is just hated and reviled and despised more than anybody? Mark Furman, right? If Mark Furman came out and said, the problem with America is daytime TV talk shows, he would be right. But would anybody give what he says any credibility, even though he's right? No. But Colin Powell has it, and there's no comparison here. I just I wanted to go from obvious worst to, gee, he can't do any wrong. And that's the range. Quick break, back to the phones in just a minute. Stay tuned for more Rush right after this on WABC. <laughs> On the cutting edge, ladies and gentlemen, of societal evolution. And we're going to start on the phones uh, in St. Joseph, Michigan. This is Steve. Hello. Oh, Rush. Welcome back. Thank you, sir. Hey, I really appreciate it. Even though, uh, you know, I miss you uh, uh, being away on vacation, I really appreciate the quality individuals that you bring forward to uh, take your place. You are more than uh, welcome, sir, and I'm glad that you uh, take note of that. 
Hey, I want to just uh, mention that uh, I believe that uh, if Packwood hadn't uh, resigned, he should have been expelled. Mm -hmm. I, I believe it uh, from, uh, from historical precedent, it, sh <clears throat> it should have happened even before that to Kennedy and other uh, individuals who were involved in uh, promiscuous situations. Um, it, uh, our founding fathers, including uh, obviously George Washington, stated that you know, public character is no evidence of true greatness. It's their uh, private virtues mm -hmm. uh, that are the foundation. And um, uh, John Witherspoon even went further in regards to that. And, I, and so I think, that, uh, I think it's good that we're beginning to move back in that direction and have some accountability for people who uh, have tried to hide their private, uh, their private lives from, um, uh, from public scrutiny, especially when it uh, is involved in... Wait, now, wait a second. Wait, wait, wait just a second. Mm -hmm. How far do you want to go in this, in saying that, every, that a public person's private life should be known? Well, I'm not, I, don't, I don't believe that, uh, you know, the, uh, the, like the Democrats say, that if, you're gonna, if, if, it's a, if it's a Republican, everything should come out in the open, and if it's a Democrat, well, we should just kind of brush over those things. I think that... I think that well, that's my... because that's what happens. Sure. I mean, you know, all the other examples that I gave and that you could give have, have been Democrats who, for the most part, uh, the, the glance has gone the other way uh, when these situations came up. And the reason why is that they're all good liberals. But even Packwood, who was a great liberal as far as the feminists were concerned, it didn't count when his pals were in the majority. When his party was in the majority is, is when the pressure on Packwood really, really built. You're right, this could have happened any time in the past. The feverish pitch could have uh, could have uh, been reached uh, two three years ago but what good would it have been then only now when you get rid of a republican uh in in the face of all these democratic resignations and the chairman of the finance committee i mean that, this is a big deal and so don't think that politics doesn't play with this this is what gets me well i agree with that i agree that po you know uh, politics is is a part of it mainly because the democrats have made it a part of it yeah yeah, but when you say that, that, that private virtue is what determines real character, I don't disagree with you, but how far do you think the, uh, the public ought to be able to look into the private lives of public people in order to determine this virtue? Is nothing sacred? Well, I, I think that there are, there are certain things, but, certain, but uh, when you look at a person's private life rush, I think that uh, it many times determines uh, what, the, what the individual is going to be like in public life. I mean, uh, one of the principles that John Witherspoon, uh, which, you know, he was a, he was a uh, signer of the Declaration of Independence and uh, uh, was, uh, you know, uh, a, uh, a teacher to many of the Founding Fathers, and one of the principles that he really uh, promoted or, or, or taught was that those people who are best friends to American liberty, who, who are ones who set themselves with the greatest firmness, and they bear down on immorality of every kind. And so I think that there are some people that are out there trying to... Uh, I think Mel Reynolds is one of those individuals. He became a congressman, and uh, he used his position to do some of the immoral things that he did. I, I believe Barney Frank oh, is one of those individuals. I, do, I, don't, I don't deny. That's not, I'm, I'm asking basically a philosophical question. We're all fortunate, lucky, happy, enthused, grateful, whatever, that we discovered all this stuff about these people. But just how much a right to it do we have? If they don't screw up and reveal it themselves, how much a right do you as Steve from St. Joseph, Michigan, without any suspicion, say, g uh, be able to demand that Bob Dole tell you what he's done in his bedroom and with who every night of his life for the past 50 years. Well, I don't think that he necessarily needs to disclose all of that. I'm just saying that if, if facts come out, such ah. as what happened with Bob Packwood, mm -hmm. that, uh, that people who have, uh, have elected him, people who are dependent upon him to... to uh, to bring public policy about, have the right to take a look at what he has done that has been brought out in public that is factual information. I don't believe in this. Well, okay, uh, all right. So you're not advocating witch hunts for virtue. You are, which is, hey, that's a great TV show title. Witch hunts for virtue. <laughs> because we have, in politics today, I mean, we got the climate set for it. We assume it, it's not just politics. Do you know that every public figure... Every prominent figure in this country is a suspect in our society. They have to have done something wrong 
Ergo, how could they have become what they are? We have that, even Pe Pe Peter Jennings, I almost uttered a graphic obscenity there, quite by accident. Uh, <clears throat> even Peter Jennings, who I guess made a speech to the Radio TV News Director Association, said that he thinks that, um, well, here it is. He said, in the rush, and he's got this right, in the rush of competitiveness, adrenaline or whatever, sometimes we say more than we know. And we like there to be a villain and a victim in too many reports, whereas in real life, very few of us are truly good or evil. So where's the restraint? And he's right. These guys, they do. There's always a villain. There's always a victim. Who's the good? Who's the evil? Who's the nice? Who's the rotten? And it's, it's always conflict here, conflict there. And we've just, our, our society is set up for it. So we've got to avoid these, these witch hunts for virtue. And without these witch hunts for virtue, how are you going to find out, Steve, whether somebody's private virtue meets your mettle? Well, I think Clarence, the Clarence Thomas uh, situation is, is one that really brought out, it, it was out it, there was accusations that were false, that were brought out. And if it had been uh, searched behind closed doors, the American people would have never found out that Anita Hill essentially was a liar. Well, but see, and, and what half the American people Clarence don't think Thomas that would have now. Never been on the Supreme Court. That's true. Half the people of this country refuse to believe that now. So, you know, some of the issue with Bob Packwood, I believe, is, yeah, I believe Bob Packwood is right that he should have had the right to confront his accusers. But I, but even uh, with all of the factual information he did, uh, at the majority of the things that were claimed that he did, he did. Yeah. I mean, he did, never really denied those things. He just said, hey, I was uh, used uh, drinking as an excuse and other excuses. Yeah, well, well you've got to question somebody's intelligence anyway to keep a diary of all this stuff. That's, the, that's the, the first thing that you have to do. And we definitely want smart people around. If you're going to keep a diary and chronicle all of your, uh, shall we say, uh, lapses of virtue, um, <clears throat> then, you know, be done with them anyway. You know what's interesting about this, though? <laughs> Do you know the, the, what, what, what forced this? It was when Packwood said, I'll go for hearings now. That's the last thing anybody wanted was public hearings. It was only when he did that that they panicked. It was only when public hearings are going to happen that everybody panicked, and that's when the Ethics Committee got going uh, for a number of reasons. A, they don't want 17 women up there pretending to be Anita Hill Jr., and they don't want a bunch of these people out there saying, you sanitaries just don't get it. You know, all of that stuff. They don't want to replay that all over again. Plus, they don't want this. It just, Packwood uh, would confront his confusers. This, uh, confusers are, are accusers, and this uh, confusers could work in this situation, too. And, uh, <laughs> oh, it would be a Donnybrook. I mean, it would, it would be, for those of us who monitor these things, it would be fun. But and it's it's precisely because of that that, that that's when the ethics committee uh, turnaround came out six zip and uh, Packwood uh, resigned the Senate and then when Dole when Dole said he'll be around for sixty or ninety days to shepherd the budget then Barbara Botcher's Boxer said gee I've just I've just put that notch in my chastity belt and now it may not count so now they had to go back in and demand that Packwood go immediately <laughs> you imagine how they felt the guy resigns. But he's going to hang around for two or three months. <laughs> I knew that wouldn't work. I knew these people would be livid. That, and, you know, they're not interested. At whatever, whatever could happen to humiliate Packwood in, in, in the most profound ways is what these people would engineer and do. They really would. Ah, and here's the difference. When O.J. is acquitted... You know, Martin and I were talking with a bunch of people. What was, what's the matter, Mr. Snurdly? You don't, you don't, you, you don't think there's a possibility otherwise, do you? Let him, let him put him on the stand. There's no possibility here. You know, this, I swore I wouldn't get started on this because this is, you know, this is the yellow brick road to nowhere. You just... Once you get on it, there's no getting off of it. But I, I'll tell you, um, when he's acquitted, <laughs> Snurdly's head jerks back in abject disappointment.
When he's acquitted, you're going to see pay-per-view special. You're going to be a hero. People were talking, Russia's life is ruined anyway. No, no, this guy's going to be the biggest hero in America. He will have gotten away with it. He'll be back in the Naked Gun movies. He'll be doing pay-per-view. He'll have a book. He'll have a, they'll have a gold bronco that Al Cowlings will drive him around in. All over the L.A. freeways. He's going to be fetid. He's gonna, Larry King will do whatever. O.J. Simpson will marry Larry King and Elizabeth Taylor on a special edition of Larry King Live. You wait and see, folks. But when Packwood goes, here's the difference. When he's finally gone, he's going to go with shame. Nobody's going to want to have anything to do with him. He's going to be rotten to the core. Nobody's going to get, get near him. In any way. You watch if this isn't true. And I'm telling you, I went back to day one with this trial, and I asked you to consider the political implications of the verdict, whatever it was, and you all poo-poo. Political implications. You wait. You wait and see. I mean, Johnny Cochran going on television after Ito's ruling on the tapes, only allowing two of the N-word references, the racial epithet references. Johnny Cochran, Los Angeles, stay calm. Stay calm. Hey, John, why don't you grab another can of gasoline while you're at it? Los Angeles State. Do Cochran says that these Laura Hart McKinney tapes have no idea how to do. And she's out there as an expert witness with this pained look. <laughs> Boy, she's a better actress than she is a screenwriter. I mean, that's just another... See, that's what I mean. You get on a yellow brick road here and you don't get off of it because all these little things keep popping out. <clears throat> but, but Cochran's out there saying that these Laura Hart McKinney tapes are to America in 95 what the Watergate tapes were to America in 1973. We'll be back. I'm a little over time here, folks. We'll be right back. No OJ, none of the time. This is the EIB Network on 77 WABC. <laughs> the artist formerly known as I'm a flake. And Rush Limbaugh, the excellence in uh, Broadcasting Network, 800-282-2882. Here's uh, Charlie in Atlanta. It's a cellular call. Hello. Hello, Rush. Uh, uh, you're a great American hero. Thank you. I wanted to talk about uh, Bob Dole and his refusal of the Log Cabin Republicans uh, donation. They're a group of gay Republicans. And as related to uh, how it relates to the lack of leadership that's generally, I think, in the Republican Party. And that I feel that he should have accepted because it was a fantastic chance to really unite the country and get a group of uh, a huge uh, special interest group coming into the fold and, and into the party. Well, I don't know about that. I, I, I don't know if, if, that, if, if accepting $1,000 from the Log Cabin Club would unite America, but I do well, agree no, with no, you. He should have kept the money. Yeah, yeah, well, absolutely. He should have kept the money. But, you know, there's a, that, is, that, that uh, group, that special interest group, has been a uh, typically a liberal... Uh, they, they've had nowhere else to go. No, not, not the Log Cabin. No, the Log Cabin guys, uh, they're all Republicans. No, I just meant gay, gay people in general. Uh, typically uh, have been liberals. And, and right. the fact that they've actually uh, uh, got a group uh, called the Log Cabin Republicans and that they're actually uh, out there realizing that there are more important issues except for, you know, beside gay rights, like the economy and reducing the debt and foreign uh, policy and what have you, that's, that's, that's a major uh, stride. And, and a leader, a, a true leader, would have uh, grasped onto that and, uh, and, and accepted, accepted the money, taken them into the fold, and said, well, we have some differences, uh, but, you know, uh, obviously... Especially we... since he's accepted their money in years previous. Oh, has he? I think so, yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm could be mistaken about that, but I don't think this is the first time the Log Cabin Club has contributed money to Dole. Yeah, I, I just think he, could, he was really pandering to the Christian Coalition, and he could have come out all right with them if he'd have simply acknowledged the differences and gone on to uh, get them in the... Well, but wait cabin. a minute. Well, who... How would anybody have even known if he hadn't given the money back? Did you know that the Log Cabin Club had given Dole any money? Actually, I didn't know. No, nobody knew it until no, he gave it back. No. But I guess he was expecting that maybe somebody would uncover <laughs> These it. poor you know? guys. I mean, it's a thousand bucks. Whoopie do. It's, it's pit diddly squat in the big scheme of things. Exactly. And so this, to, to turn around and give it, it's just, it's, I, I agree with you on one hand that it, it's, a, it's a flagrant, obvious attempt to pander to a specific group of people. Who? Log Cabin Club? Gays? Filthy money. I am not taking it. Oh, he's our man. Doesn't work that way. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that those... That, that's, that's not... 
Sorry, that's just not what the American people look for. I, I agree with you in, in, the, in the overall thing you're saying about leadership. I've been on this uh, <clears throat> riff myself for, uh, for quite a while. But I, I'd, I'd also, uh, log cabin uh, Republicans have always been a, a, a select few, and I don't think that, that there is any big movement. I could be wrong here, too, because I, I, I just haven't seen anything about it, but I, I don't think that there's any big movement from the left to the right by most politically active homosexuals or gay groups. I think they're, they're pretty much solidified on the left, and that's, that's where they're going to stay, no matter what Dole does or any other candidate uh, with, uh, with their contribution. Charlie, thanks for the call, though. I enjoyed talking to you. We'll be right back. You're listening to the EIB Network on 77 WABC. Ronald Reagan accepted $1,000 or whatever the limit then was from the Log Cabin Club during his presidency. And his aides, his advisors, suggested in most strong terms that he refuse it, send it back. He said, I will not. By no means will I refuse a donation. Because in making the donation, the members of the Log Cabin Club are signing on to my agenda. I am not signing on to theirs. Now, just because I accept money from somebody does not mean that I all of a sudden agree with them. It's the other way around. And if they agree with me, that's what I'm here for. And so I will gladly take their money. Which is what Dole should have done. But the question still remains in 1995, what would General Powell do? And until we have the answer to that, we cannot move forward. An excellent role model for the youth of America, Rush Limbaugh, serving humanity, back from vacation, having picked up my second Marconi Award, for excellence in broadcasting at the National Association of Broadcasters radio convention over the weekend in New Orleans. I was not there. This is one of those things where you don't have to go to win the award, like so many of the awards I have been offered have been. Hey, if you'll come, we'll give you the award. If I don't come, I don't get it. That's right. I guess I really haven't won it then, have I? Not until you show up. But this was not that way. Here is uh, Estelle in Whiting, New Jersey. Welcome to the program. Hi, Rush. Hi. Congratulations on your award. Thank you. I didn't see it mentioned in any newspapers, by the way. You won't. <laughs> well, I always look for your name in some of the newspapers because, like you say, uh, many times they quote you, misquote you, and there's always that little edge that they put in. Uh, there was an article in this morning's uh, Star Ledger uh, that we get here. It's about a poll that was taken by the Roper Starch Worldwide uh, Group. It's based on telephone interviews with 500 children, ages 9 through 12. Oh, I saw this. Yeah. The poll was done for the new Time for Kids, the magazine. Yeah. Okay. According to this poll, uh, of course, Michael Jordan and Jackson topped the name recognition list, which goes into what you were saying just a little while ago. Right. Must be a bunch of racist kids. Uh, that well, <laughs> right. Well, the best part is Tom Hanks got higher than... Hillary Rodham Clinton with 84%, 82%. Not surprising. And you were recognized by only 48% of those surveyed. Now, I think that's pretty good for ages 9 through 12, skulls full of mush. Stop and think of this, folks, because I, I agree with you, and I wouldn't even have brought this up if it weren't for the fact that a concerned caller is alerting our attention to this. Okay. But now, seriously, now, here's, here's, I saw the story, it was an Associated Press story. Right. And it talked about how uh, politicians don't rank on the name recognition scale nearly as well as entertainers. Yes. And it, it then listed Hanks and the athletes and Michael Jackson, Michael Jordan, and so forth, and mentioned Hillary getting 82% or whatever it was, mm -hmm. which is only four points below Hanks, is what right. it said, my copy said. And then it said, and it, but it mentioned everybody was way, way ahead of Rush Limbaugh. Yes. So how does it actually read? Do you have it in front of you? It's, yeah, I do. It read just the, the sentence with me in it. What does okay, it say? Okay, it just says that First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton was recognized by 82% of those surveyed. Yeah. Just 4% lower than actor Tom Hanks and much higher yeah. than Rush Limbaugh who was recognized by only 48% of those surveyed. Now. And it goes on to say 20% recognized Boris Yeltsin. And Mandela. And Mandela. Right. Now, here's the question. When I saw that, and I, I must tell you something, like you, Estelle, I was thrilled. Here you have ages 9 through 12. 9 through, ages 9 through 12. Is that right? 
Right. It's not grades. It's ages no, 9 ages through 12. 9 through 12, they're in school when this program is on. Yeah. And for 48% of those people around the country, 48% of the 9, 10, and 11, and 12-year-olds. Right. To have heard of me in this program is phenomenal. I think it's terrific. It's phenomenal. Yes. But they've reported as much. Only. Yeah, only. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Listen, uh, yeah. while you're smoking your fine cigar, could I make a comment on the anti-smoking campaign that's going on? How do you know that I am smoking? Oh, you just, said so. I just said so. I listen to okay. every word you Thank say. Thank you. Never mind. Okay. May I make a comment? Sure. Go right ahead. Okay. I'm a former teacher and a former substance abuse counselor. And I can almost bet you that when cigarettes get too high to, to buy, the cost of cigarettes get too high to buy for teenagers and too scarce for them, they're going to go to marijuana because it's cheaper and it's more available. And it's more exciting. Yes. And you're going to get a problem that is going to explode exp exponentially because I know that, that most substance uh, uh, users and abusers go to the next cheapest and most available substance. That's right. So you're going to have a big problem. That's how you ended up with Mrs. Dukakis drinking lighter fluid. Thanks, Estelle. Dan in Jefferson City, Missouri. Hello. Welcome to the program. Yes, I'm holding for the doctor of democracy. I'm in dire need of mental floss for the mind. Here we go, sir. I am, I am right here. The floss is ready. Yes, sir. I uh, Show me dittos from Missouri, by the way. Thank you. It was rubbing alcohol, by the way. Lighter oh, fluid. It's, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. I... Uh, I think I picked up on some liberal press bias and uh, over the weekend, and I wanted to bounce it off of you to see. No, if you're no, no, no. This is not possible. You found media bias over the weekend. It's possible, sir. How did it happen? Well, I was listening to. I thought we had eradicated the U.S. The, uh, problem. Sunday talk shows and National People's Radio this morning, and they were going on about Packwood and his diaries, and how he says he might have made some mistakes with regards to uh, Phil Graham and donations and whatnot. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, I, I've had mental flashbacks to Josh Steiner and yeah. his diary. Where he lied to his diary. Well, yes. Packard just got it wrong in his, but uh, Steiner lied to his. Um, the press didn't seem to care too much about Josh and his uh, problems with his diaries, and all of a sudden, gee, you know... Um, I don't understand well, this. Well, Senator Packwood and inconsistencies in his, and it's a major deal. No, come on, come on. You understand this? Packwood's a Republican. Josh Steiner's a liberal. He's in the Clinton administration. He's to be saved. It is to be saved. Packwood is to go, to be sacrificed. This, this is not complicated, and I'm not being simplistic when I say this. Packwood's a Republican. And you can't say it's because Packwood's a conservative in this case, because he's not. Well, on very many things, Packwood is not a conservative at all. This is simply... No, sexual harassment, racism. I mean, these are the these are the two uh, sacraments now. These we, the two religions uh, that the left in this country uh, uh, demands that everybody obey and worship. And the people who violate the newfound tenets, they are the new sinners. And there will be no forgiveness, none whatsoever. Don't expect any. We'll be back. Did not say that we do not have people in this country who are racists. Mm -hmm. Didn't say that at all. I simply offered evidence of a belief that the country at large is not a racist country. Well, I, as and an, I, African, cite, and I, I as an African American, would like to would tend to disagree with you. And um, you know, if you walk a mile in my shoes, maybe you would understand. Well. I'll tell you something, sir. We all have our uh, uh, crosses to bear. We all have something about us that is uh, n not appreciated by others. We all have things that we're discriminated against because of. And uh, the simple fact of the matter is what I've tried to do is offer evidence that for America to be as racist as the civil rights movement in this country portrays, none of the things that I mentioned would be possible. Well, you wouldn't have a, a black middle class rising in number and prosperity in this country as it is if America were as racist as people think it to be. Well, the individuals you put forth um, are not, you know, they don't represent, they represent a good, a small portion of America, a black America. I mean, of that 12% of, that we make up, I mean, the people you mentioned, they only make up, they probably make up less than 5%. Doesn't matter. That's it does, irrelevant. It does it's make a totally difference. irrelevant to the point that I made. Uh -huh. The point that I made is these people are multimillionaires. They enjoy some of the highest popularity that any individuals in this country have ever enjoyed. 
and it wouldn't be possible if it weren't for the fact uh -huh. that they were loved and adored by a majority of whites. Well, you think about Sammy Davis Jr. and Paul Robeson back during the 30s and 40s, and, you know, coming up during that time, the 40s and 50s and stuff, and you say that America wasn't racist, predominantly racist back then? I'm talking about America today. And I am not saying, once again, I guess I'm going to have to say... I'm talking about predominantly know. racist. I mean, Mr. Lombard, you I'm saying we've made great America. strides. My if you want to continue to live in the 30s and 40s and 50s, then you are going to have a huge problem. Nobody can live in the past. I can't do it. You can, much as we would like to. But all you're going to accomplish by living in the past is making of yourself a victim. And you're better than that. You're better than allowing people to turn you into a victim. I can tell by talking to you. How do you do? Fine, thank you. Hey, uh, I had a couple of comments. First of all, our country was founded by God and in God, and he looks upon every life form, every human being as valuable, regardless of the skin color. That, enough said. That's on the vertical level. On the horizontal level, with Mark Furman, I, uh, where does freedom of speech stop? Well, I mean, I've got, uh, you know, freedom of speech, but we've got the broken noses to prove it. If uh, you say the N-word or the F-word or whatever word, is there some limit to freedom of speech? Isn't he entitled to say whatever he wants to without it? Uh, isn't that his privilege under our Constitution? Oh, yeah, come on. Of course he can. But, but Furman uh, obviously has, uh, has committed perjury here. Uh, uh, th this is, um, this is uh, uh, all the defense has. You must understand here that, that they have to prove nothing. All they've got to do is raise some kind of doubt. They know what they're dealing with. They know it's, it's obvious what they're trying to do. And it's, it's, uh, it's despicable if you look at it in the context of trying to find the truth. It's obvious these people are trying to obfuscate the truth. Because uh, th there's, there's no evidence whatsoever linking Furman to planting the glove or to, or to planting evidence. There is evidence to him saying uh, these tapes that, uh, that he has done it or here's how to do it or whatever. But in this specific case, it doesn't exist. I'll tell you, I, the reason I took your call is, is because I, I misunderstood uh, what you were going to say about freedom of speech. Uh, I thought you were going to criticize Furman, or others would criticize Furman for taking the Fifth, asserting his Fifth Amendment privilege and, uh, and so forth. I, th there is an issue out here, and Jim, thanks for the call. I, I appreciate it. There's something going on here that, that has been raised, I think, in a, a peripheral way, that to me is is fascinating as a philosophical and legal and, and dare I say constitutional way and that is the battle here over what part of the Constitution shall prevail forget what you think you know about OJ Simpson and what you think you know that he did and just look at the constitutional right that anybody in this country who is accused of anything has. And that is the right to confront your accuser. Okay? I don't care what you think O.J. has done to deny any defendant the right to challenge an accuser is a huge step. But then on the other side of this, you've got the accuser with his... Fifth Amendment right not to incriminate himself. This is why, when you get right down to it, this is why you have judges, and this is why I find, I've always felt, that you need really extraordinary people to be judges. Because you've got a battle here of the Fifth and Sixth Amendment right in front of your face, and how do you decide it? How do you say that O.J.'s rights as a defendant should be subordinated to Furman's rights as an accuser. Or take out defendant and accuser and say, how do you decide one person's rights shall supersede another person's rights? The right to not incriminate yourself weighed against the right to confront those who are accusing you of these crimes. After all, O.J. Simpson's life's not at stake here, but the rest of his life in prison is a possibility. And it, it is a fascinating discussion that you, if you want to engage in it, because you have to get into details at that point. And you have to, if, you, if you're going to be honest and objective, you have to say, well, how can he take the Fifth Amendment after he's already testified? He didn't take the Fifth Amendment when he was originally called. He testified. He said something. The defense has every right to discredit 
or to try to discredit. But if the accuser says, I'm not going to take the, I'm going to assert my Fifth Amendment privilege, the judge uh, has to say what will uh, give, be given the priority. I think it's just, in, in, the, in, the, in the sense of having a constitution, to take O.J. and Furman out of this, put any two people in it you want. Just put two human beings and have the conversation. And of course, if you want to put in the specific details of this case, feel free to do so. But then have the conversation with somebody and find out how twisted and turned you get. Trying to do the right thing without any prejudice. And see, this is, this is where it really gets tough because you've got to eliminate all prejudice. You've got to, you've got to take the prejudice out of the fact that whatever you think Furman's up to and has done, and you've got to take the prejudice of whether or not O.J. is innocent or guilty out of it and discuss it purely on a constitutional basis. It's no question about it, a constitutional conflict here. And the answer is not in the Constitution. It doesn't say, and if Amendment 5 and Amendment 6 conflict, Amendment 6 shall prevail. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say whether or not the accused right to confront his accuser supersedes the right of somebody else not to incriminate themselves. What would you do if you were Judge Ito? What, you're answering it, Mr. Snurdly? What would you do? Let the testimony in. What do you mean, let the testimony in? Furman? What if he won't? You mean you're going to make him testify? You're going to force him? You can't! In front of the jury, force him. But you can't do that either because, as a concept of law, a jury is not allowed to arrive at a decision as the result of speculation. And if you demand that somebody assert the fifth in the presence of a jury, that's, that's never going to happen because the appellate court in L.A. already said so. And, and, and this is a matter of L.A. case law. I mean, Ito had no prayer on this one. Ito's trying to balance this. I'll tell you what Ito tried to do. He, he tried to uh, say that the jury could infer whatever they wanted by Furman's lack of presence. But he wouldn't bring Furman in to, to assert the fifth in front of the jury. Well, they're both the same. They are one and the same. And the court said you can't do it. It's just like taking the fifth. And there's case law in the books that says you can't charge a jury that way. You can't give them those kinds of instructions. The only thing they could do here, if they really want to hear what Furman has to say, is give, uh, is give him immunity. <laughs> give him immunity. And you know who will be the first, and if they haven't done it, I'm surprised, but you know who will be the first to suggest this will be O.J.'s defense team. They'll be the first to give Furman immunity, guarantee him immunity from any prosecution whatsoever, including all the way up the federal ladder, and have him tell us what he did. W.A.B.C. How are you? Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Rush Limbaugh on the EIB Network, Painesville, Ohio. This is Terry. I'm glad you called, sir. Welcome. Hi, Rush. Hey, I want to let you know I make my living, living flying a business jet. And every time that I fly over Cape Girardeau, Missouri, I bow my head in respect and avail myself of a brief moment of silence. Thank you. What kind of jet do you fly? A uh, Learjet. Uh, 35, 55, 60? The 31A. 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 That's like driving a Porsche, folks, yeah, if you don't hot, know. Right? Sure is. Is. Yeah. Hey, listen, I know you were on vacation when this happened. I've been dying to hear a brief essay from you about the... The quick, rude education on democratic political politics that Mel Reynolds got on the Larry King live show when he talked about the call that he got from David Bonnier. You familiar with that? I did not uh, see uh, Congressman Reynolds on uh, on the Larry King uh, show. Well, it's very interesting. He uh, Larry asked him how his friends in Congress had been treating him, and he said, well, he's kind of puzzled. He said, interestingly enough, I consider myself a good Democrat, but I got a call from David Bonnier asking, uh, hey, Mel, what's going on? And uh, in effect, what happened was they got uh, chatting for a little bit, and David Bonnier said, well, well, good luck, pal. I wish the best to you. We're out here looking out for you. He said, uh, you know how these uh, terrible Republicans are going to try and embarrass uh, us with this. And Mel hung up with him, and a couple of hours later, he got a call uh, from a, a reporter saying, the Associated Press wants to know what comment you have on the letter from David Bonnier. And Mel was confused. He said, what letter? He says, well, there's a letter coming over the fax. So he went, and he was, he was with an associate there, and they got the letter, and it was a letter from David Bonnier demanding his resignation. And Mel Reynolds says, I don't get it. I just told these guys that I was going to re resign, write a letter of resignation on September 1st to be effective on October 1st. He says, all it was was the Democrats trying to show that they were more moral than the Republicans. 
And he said he, he then he, he got something from Gephardt that chimed in, and Pat Schroeder chimed in. He said, Pat Schroeder hadn't talked to me in three years that I've been in Congress. Wouldn't even give me the time of day and, and wouldn't even acknowledge my existence. Uh, uh, so, uh, I wasn't sure so, what he, whether you had heard that, but no, it, no, you no, know, no, he's no. had a rude uh, awakening here. So he, uh, he told these guys that he was going to resign, and after telling them that, they all go out with letters demanding his resignation. Yeah, the, especially the little pit Yorkie David Bonnier, who had just called him a couple hours ago. These poltroons. In fact, these are a bunch of poltroons, ladies, a spineless, spiritless cowards. I'm surprised you hadn't heard that, but I knew you were enjoying your vacation, and, I, and I've been dying to hear what you'd have to say about it. Yeah, you know, the, the only... The, uh, I only had one question about Mel Reynolds' appearance on the Larry King show. I didn't watch it, but I only had one question about it, and that is, how much will Larry suck up to him? And call him a great guy, and um, <clears throat> all this kind of stuff. Did that happen? Not, not really. There really? There was a lot that they talked about. Really? But, yeah, I mean, he was... He, he certainly got off of this topic quickly. So that falls in line with what you're saying. Larry King didn't want to hear too much about how the Democrats uh, skewered him. And, 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 you know, did Larry, I, let's see now, I can, I can pretty guess a question Larry would ask. Uh, would, did Larry say by any chance, so Mel, what went wrong? Yeah, there was a lot of that. Really? Yeah. What there, went wrong? There was a lot. Yeah. Anything about when's the movie and who's going to direct? <laughs> no, nothing along those lines. But I, I just thought it was absolutely amazing. I save the tape, I show it to all my friends, and I say, look, this is the kind of thing that goes on in democratic politics now. These guys are so scared of losing power, they, it, you know, it's, it's absolutely unbelievable. No, no, I'm it's saving so, it. I'm so, putting in my family archives. So scared of having lost power. Right. Yeah. yeah they have, that's yeah. for sure. All right, thanks a whole lot. I appreciate it, Terry. Thank you for uh, the update. I knew this would have to happen. There had to be something that happened while I was gone I didn't know about that you people would have to inform me. And I think that's kind of interesting. Host gets informed by audience. A unique concept for this show. Uh, <clears throat> Pat in Los Angeles. Hello, welcome to our program. Thank you very much, Rush. Thank Hi. you for taking my call. You bet. Mega dittos for my husband and myself. We're Thank both big fans. Thank you. Okay, now that, <clears throat> I wonder if you know that you have been transferred on KCAL, not Channel 9 in L.A., from 6.30 in the evening, and that you've been on there for ages, to 1 o'clock in the morning. Yes, ma'am, I am aware of this. Well, I am furious, and so is everybody else that I know. And I've called, and I've expressed the way I feel, and I've told all my friends to call. I think this is horrendous that they put you on at 1 o'clock in the morning. Well, it is, but you, there, I, I, I don't know why, because um, apparently our uh, uh, rating support out there has been very good, so there's, there's no reason to move it on that account. You know what I suspect? That station's owned by Disney. Oh. And, and I would suspect that Disney has some uh, syndicated programming it has an interest in or something that they want to run at that time. I, I, th 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 there, there's so many reasons that things happen in television that it would take me from now until tomorrow to run down all the possibilities. But uh, that, that, would be, that would be one of my uh, earlier guesses. Well, I think, it's, I think it's terrible, and I hope that all of your fans and your listeners in L.A. call and complain, because I certainly have, and I will again. And I've told all my friends to call. <laughs> okay, well, for those of you in L.A., just remember, she said she did it. I did, it that's right. <laughs> it me. I'm flattered. I, I, I appreciate your support. Well, uh, we'll just I have really... to set the alarm for 1 o'clock in the morning and get well, up to you have a, uh, <laughs> you can do that. Do you have a VCR? Yeah, we do. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Yes. Or else you can go out and get a satellite dish, and, uh, and you'll be able to get it at 6 p.m. if you get a satellite dish. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, well, that's interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Now, not the 18-inch dish. Okay. Now, you've got to go out and get a bigger one than that, so get, get the direct feed. You get it 6 or 7.30. Okay. We, we feed it out uh, twice. Oh, good. Okay, um, well, that helps anyway. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, uh, I in fact, I'm getting, th this is the time of year, by the way, when we have numerous uh, station changes in television. Uh, we end our contract with one station, new season begins, stations decide to either change network affiliations or what have you, and one station... Um, will decide to change its syndicated programming in favor of others, and another station picks it up. And predominantly what you hear, uh, the press has great time reporting that such and such a station no longer will carry the Limbaugh show. They do not report to you which one's picking it up, which almost always happens. It almost always gets picked up, and you're left in a lurch thinking 
that the show is uh, is not there, especially when it changes stations. But you just have to look at your listings. And if you really care about it, beginning tonight about 9 o'clock, stay up until about 3, watch every channel you have at the beginning of every half hour, and I guarantee you'll find us. <laughs> and then you'll know where we are. <laughs> for, for, I, it, folks, I'll tell you, television is the strangest animal uh, that I've ever been involved in. It's, it's, it, 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 in, in, especially as compared to the way business is done in radio. It's, it's just entirely different. And uh, try, trying to get a handle on it is impossible. It really is. Well, what are you laughing at, Mr. Snurdly? Uh, oh, yeah. The, <clears throat> Limbaugh says TV is filled with animals. I can just see it now. In the headlines. Got to go. Quick break. We'll be back in a moment. You were listening. Hi, Russ. Thanks for taking my call. Yes, sir. My pleasure. Uh, I can't say dittos, but I do appreciate what you're doing there. Thank you. Um, I, I was intrigued by Colin Powell and his interview. I haven't been able to catch much of it, but, uh, I think he's the only possibility for me in the Republican Party. Uh, I'm a founding member of United We Stand America, but I'd never vote for Ross Perot. Uh, I just feel that we got to do something, and Republicans let me down a couple of times. Uh, they let me down with the balanced budget amendment and the other issues that, uh, they kind of backtracked on, I think, a little bit. And... And you think, you think, you think, based on what you've heard Colin Powell say, you think you're going to get more action than already we've gotten on these issues you claim to care about from General Powell? Well, I, I'm pro-choice also, which is a major problem. And, and I'm, I'm also... So then why didn't you mention that first? You mentioned the balanced budget amendment and the Republicans have let you down. On what specifically? And what, not only have, what have they let you down on, but where does Colin Powell provide the remedy? Well, I'm not sure. I haven't read his book yet, but, but I'm But yet he's the it. guy for you. This is